Okay, well, praise the Lord. It's great to have you guys tonight. Uh, what a lively crowd. We've got some visitors. It's great to see you guys here tonight. Well, let's just begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come to you tonight, and we're just so uh, looking forward to meeting with you once again, Lord, through the study of your word as we've worshipped you here tonight. Lord, we know your spirit is here with us. And Father, we just come and desire to be taught by you. Father, we desire to have your spirit just come and wash us and cleanse us and draw us into a closer relationship with you. And Father, we just open our hearts to you now as we open your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, tonight we're going to look at Abraham and Sarah, once again, um, looking at the promise that God's making to Abraham that he will become the father of many nations. Of course, at this point, he is Abram, uh, exalted father, but he doesn't have any kids. And so there's a problem with that. Uh, but the Lord knows the real deal, and uh, he knows that uh, eventually he's going to have a child. And so tonight, we see uh, another failure on the part of Abram and his wife Sarai, as they are not willing to wait upon the Lord. And they, desi- they make a a determination that, uh, hey, we can fix this problem. And Sarai tells Abram, why don't you go ahead and uh, take my maid over here and uh, we can have children through her because evidently God's not hearing our prayers and is not fulfilling that promise. Uh, And so tonight uh, we'll look at that. But what we see within that is just the works of the flesh. Uh, What a representation of the works of the flesh that is to us. Uh, I'm not willing to wait on the Lord. I'm not willing to wait upon His Spirit. I'm not willing to be led by Him. I'm just going to step out and and I'll make this thing happen. And uh, and we know that that is a work of the flesh, not a work of the Spirit. Uh, So there are some great lessons for us in this tonight. Um, As we begin here tonight, I wanted to just point out what uh, Galatians says about the walking in the Spirit and not in the flesh. Uh, It says in Galatians 5.16, Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. He goes on there to talk about the works of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, Outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so that whole list that we saw there, uh, we're going to see quite a bit of, of that in the story tonight. Uh, envies and jealousies and, and hatreds and, and those kind of things. They run rampant when we allow our flesh to make the decisions, when we allow our flesh to be driving the bus, as it were. Uh, You know, I'm going to allow my flesh to dictate how I'm going to live my life, or am I going to allow my spirit, or God's spirit, rather, to dictate how I'm going to live my life. And uh, the outcomes are very, very different when we uh, allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. Our life is filled with... uh, God's will being accomplished within our life. And of course, as a result of that, there is great fulfillment in life in general. Uh, There's nothing like a life that is led by the Holy Spirit and led in God's will uh, because it brings you to a place of realizing God is using me. God is involved in my life. God is leading my life. And there's no fulfillment. There's, There's no kind of joy that can outdo that. And so tonight... Again, we'll begin there in chapter 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian uh, maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, 
and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I, have, I gave my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. So Abram said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said to Hagar, Sarah's maid, Where have you come from, and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress, and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so that they shall not be counted for multitude. The angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Then she called the name of the Lord, who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore the well was called uh, that title right there. Uh, Observe it It is between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So there you have the story. I wanted to just kind of read through the whole thing to give you just the idea of what was going on here. Uh, you've probably read this before, but what, a, what an incredible thing it is. Um, not willing to wait on the Lord, are they? Um, I've had it. The Lord has not fulfilled that promise. I know He's been telling us that for years, but I have had it. Uh, the Lord has restrained me. He's kept me back in a way, is what Sarai is saying. He's restrained me from having children, from bearing children. Please, go into my maid. Here, I've got an idea. I've got an idea how I can fix this problem. And it sounds so good, doesn't it? Uh, It sounds, oh, this will work. Yes, I'll have a child and all my dreams will be fulfilled. I'll I'll be happy finally because I'll have that child and and everything will be wonderful once I have that child from this maidservant. Uh, Everything will be fulfilled, right? Uh, Well, no. Actually, when we partake of those works of the flesh, it seems like it's going to fulfill all of our needs. It seems like it's going to make us happy. It seems like it's going to be the greatest thing ever. But once the, uh, the fruit of that work of the flesh becomes evident, we begin to be despised and we begin to have hardship. We begin to have strife. We begin to have all kinds of issues going on in our life because we didn't wait on the Lord, because we didn't allow Him to have His perfect will and His perfect way in our lives. And, and now there's just hardship, there's heartache, there's suffering, there's pain, there is uh, people upset with each other and, and strife and division. All kinds of problems result when we don't wait on the Lord in that way. So it's quite a picture for us here tonight. And, you know, it's not just, well, here's what I think about this. The Bible talks about this particular incident all the way through. Uh, Many times we'll see uh, the New Testament saying, hey, this is a type of the work of the flesh. That's why you need to walk in the Spirit. Because this is what happens when we take things on to our own account and begin to say, God, I've got this. I don't need you. All right, well... Going back over this, a couple of things we want to look at here. Hagar uh, was probably a, a gift from the Pharaoh. You remember that another work of the flesh, Abram going down to Egypt, uh, he was brought to the promised land by the Lord. A famine comes along in the land and Abram decides, well, I've got to go take care of my family. I'm going to leave this promised land that God's brought me to and go down to Egypt. And uh, we don't know for sure, but most likely because Hagar is an Egyptian woman, she was probably one of the the slaves that Pharaoh gave to Abram when 
again, another work of the flesh. Abram was too afraid of what was going to happen to him down there in Egypt. Uh, too afraid, hey, my wife's beautiful. Those Egyptians, they love beautiful women. They're going to snatch my wife away and they're going to kill me so they can have her. And so he says to the Pharaoh and his men, you know, she's my sister. And, uh, and you remember that Pharaoh treated him very well as a result and gave him all kinds of slaves and gave him all kinds of animals and things. And so most likely this woman is a result of that. Now we don't know that for sure, but that's definitely uh, a good possibility. Uh, one way or the other, she came up from Egypt, and, uh, and that's how she came into the care of Abram. Well, it's quite amazing what is being said here. It, if you look at the old King James or the new King James language there, it, it's pretty soft, but some of the translations uh, really just bear it out there for you. Hey, go have sex with my, my slave girl here is basically what uh, Sarai is saying. Uh, here's a translation for you, Genesis 16:2. The Lord has not allowed me to have children, so go sleep with my, my slave, is essentially what's being said here. Very direct. Uh, there's no getting around that. Uh, sometimes the language of the older translations kind of hide it a little bit, you know. But uh, here's the thing. Hey, the Lord has not allowed me, uh, and it's not fair. God hasn't allowed me. God hasn't given me this thing that I really want. And so uh, I'm going to take things into my own hands. And uh, here, go sleep with my, my slave. And that's just uh, the brutal truth of what's going on here. Uh, it's quite amazing what's being said. Well, again, this idea of works of the flesh. I want you to hold your place there just for a minute. We'll go back over to Romans and see what Paul has to say about walking in the spirit, walking in the flesh. <clears throat> and those kind of things. He's talked quite a bit about his wretchedness. Oh, wretched man that I am, he said in chapter 7. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And of course, he's looking at that tradition that the Romans had. When, when someone would murder another person, they would take that murdered body and they would strap it to the murderer. And you would have to carry this dead body around with you until that dead body corroded into your body and killed you. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. Oh, wretched man that I am. I've got this dead body hanging on me. And that's what my flesh is. And that's what your flesh is. Uh, this old man that wants to corrode us and drag us down. But Paul says uh, in the next chapter, thank God there's a chapter 8 of Romans, huh? Therefore, now there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, because in Christ we have died. That old man is dead, it's gone, and we have been raised to newness of life, and we are now walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, or at least we should be. And, and so he says there, you know, we don't have that condemnation anymore, because we're in Christ Jesus and we don't walk according to the flesh anymore, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he con condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And so there's that encouragement for us. Not to have our minds wrapped up in the things of this world and the things of the flesh and the desires of the flesh and the things that are against what the Lord wants us to be doing, but to be thinking about the things the Lord has in store for us, to be thinking about His promises, to be thinking about His uh, will, His love, His forgiveness, His grace, His mercy, and His plan for all of mankind, to have our mind on those things and not to have our mind set upon ourselves. Hey, me, 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 me. That's what it's all about, isn't it? It's all about me. It's all about my flesh and how I can make my flesh feel good. How I can pamper the old man 
and make him feel all right. Uh, he's too hot, well, let's cool him down a little bit. If he's hungry, let's feed him. If he's, you know, uh, whatever the, the situation might be, let's take care of the needs of the flesh. Those, that's the foremost thing that we're looking for in this life. But the Lord says to us, no, you, you are to be controlled not by your flesh, but to be controlled by my spirit and allow your spirit to drive the bus and not your flesh. Well, I don't want to spend too much time on that. We'll talk about that as we go through here. But again, uh, Hagar, her name is a stranger, a sojourner. And that is probably a name that Abram gave to her uh, or the, uh, kind of a title. She's a person who is not from this land of Canaan, but she is from Egypt. And so she is a sojourner in this land up in uh, Canaan. Well, it's interesting. Um, another thing that we can look at uh, as you uh, hold your place again in Genesis, if you've already turned back there, in Galatians, we find another very interesting thing about this story. Again, the New Testament is kind of an explanation of the things that you find in the Old Testament. Oftentimes, we find these strange stories within the Old Testament, and you think, well, what's that all about? What does that mean? Why did God take the time for us to uh, read this or to try to understand it? And then you get into the New Testament and you find an explanation of what this means in a spiritual sense to us. And so in Galatians chapter 4, uh, we have exactly that. In, chap- in verse 22, uh, he begins there to talk about Hagar and this situation. As he is speaking to the Galatians who are uh, people who... Uh, know God's law. They, they know the law of Moses and they're trying to live by it, but they get saved. They come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ, but along comes the Judaizers and they say, hey, you guys need to get circumcised and you guys need to keep the law. We know Jesus is good and he's from God and, and he's your Messiah and all that, but still, you've got to keep the law. You've got to go back and hold on to those truths of the law. And Paul comes back to them very strongly in this epistle. He says to the Galatians, no, uh, those things were a type and a shadow of things to come. And so he says to them there in verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. And he who he of the free woman through promise which things are symbolic. Ah, there we go. For these are the two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above, talking about spiritual Jerusalem, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. And I'm not going to go into that whole thing, but in verse 28, it says, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. Even so, it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And so he's drawing this distinction between the works of the flesh, the the appetites of the flesh, and the things that happen in the natural world with the promise that God has in store for those who have not an ability to keep the law but those who have faith in God and those who are justified by their faith in God. And so talking about that. So he says, cast out the bondwoman. It's a a picture of that old man before Christ comes and gives us new life. All right, well, we can turn on back over to Genesis chapter 16 again. See a couple more things here. Uh, What do we find when... This, this, this uh, thing has come to fruition. Uh, Hagar goes in with Abram and she conceives. 
And very soon, Sarai begins to realize that, hey, this is not working out the way I thought it was going to. In fact, this is horrible. Get this woman out of here. This is awful. Now uh, I'm in this place of being despised by this, this sinful situation that I brought upon myself. But she says, hey, it's on you, it's on you Abram. She begins to blame it on him almost. In verse 4, he went to, into Hagar and she conceived. When she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai said to Abram, my wrong be upon you. It's your fault, Abram. Why would she say that? That's an amazing thing. But you know, the, the man is called to be the spiritual head, isn't he? It was his decision. She says, hey, I've got an idea. Here, let's try this. Okay. Abram says, all right, you want me to, oh, you're maid? Okay, all right, if you say so, honey. And uh, <laughs> what, what kind of spiritual headship is that, huh? What a mess. What a mess that he creates there. She says, my wrong be upon you. It's your, it's your deal now, Abram. You've got to deal with this in a sense. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised. The Lord judged between me and you, certainly. Well, another thing that we see that is once we you know, go down that road, it, it sends us into a place of, man, this is not the way I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be so much nicer. And that is the deception of sin, isn't it? Sin always has that appearance of this is really going to make me happy. This is really going to uh, you know, just do the trick for me in my life. But once we take a bite of that apple, uh, take a bite of that forbidden fruit, take a bite of that, uh, you know, turning against the will of the Lord in a sense in our lives, uh, it, it becomes very rotten very quickly. Uh, and it sends us into bondage often. And now here they have this problem. What are we going to do about this? Uh, what are we going to do with this child now coming? And, and I've got this maid that despises me, and now we have friction in the household. Now, uh, you know, we don't have this happy life that we had before. And now also there, there's a hatred going back and forth. It's an interesting thing that we see here. When we allow ourselves to go down that road and we allow ourselves to partake in those works of the flesh, we often uh, just take a weapon and put it right in Satan's hand and allow him to start reaping all kinds of destruction within our lives and in the lives of others. And you think about that in the light of what's going on between Abram and his children that will come eventually, the the children of Israel, the children of promise, the family of faith that we've been talking about, and these uh, Ishmaelites that will grow up around them. They will have their hand against Israel, and Israel will be against against them. And, And it is now a weapon in the hand of Satan to cause all kinds of problems down the road in the future. And so in verse 6, Abraham said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. You know, I, I just think about that in, in the light of you know, our sinful lives and the, and the things that we want so badly, but then when, once they come about and they're, they're a, a despised thing in our eyes now, We just want to get it away from me. Just get it away. Cast it away. And often children are are in the midst of that. Often children find that uh, they are the victims of those kind of situations. A work of the flesh that produces a child uh, that is now despised. And, uh, you know, just get it away. I don't want to have to deal with that. Put that thing away. And, of course, that uh, results in abortion often. You know, I I remember... uh, 1984, I was in uh, the 12th grade. I was halfway through my 12th grade year. My uh, lovely wife and I were dating, and, uh, you know, we were not walking with the Lord. We were not um, walking with Him whatsoever, and we were partaking in these kind of activities. And uh, uh, it produced a child. My wife conceived, and I despised that. Hey, I don't want to deal with that anymore. Get it away from me. And I just told her, you just you deal with it. I don't care. You know, it's not my kid. I'm not going to deal with it. And, uh, you know, I, that, that's upon me. 
my, that, that wrong is upon me. And that's a, uh, you know, here it is, almost 30 years now have gone by. Uh, but I still have that on my conscience. I still have that as, you know, I was responsible for a child being aborted. I was responsible for that. My wife still deals with that. We both deal with it. Now, we know that we have victory over it. We know that the Lord has uh, done the work and, and uh, we know that we're forgiven for those things. Uh, all that stuff is still good, but still, uh, it, it just goes to show you, uh, just get it away from me. And that's how we are as human beings. Our sin produces death. Our sin produces uh, all kinds of, of pain and suffering in the lives of many, many people that we didn't intend to inflict upon them, but it, it just happens as a result of our sin. But our selfishness says, just get it away from me. I don't want to have to deal with it. Just, you know, get it out of here. You do what you want to do with her. You know, it's not my problem anymore. And that is really the heart of a man that is walking in the flesh. That's the heart of a woman that's walking in the flesh. I don't want to deal with it. I don't care who it hurts. I don't care about this woman anymore. Just get her out of here. Is kind of the idea that you see. And, and so Sarai treated her harshly. Get out of here. Be gone. And so she fled. She ran away. But the Lord comes and comforts, doesn't he? And we see that next. And uh, I was just thinking about that old song. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world. You guys remember that? Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Uh, I, I think it's such a testimony what we see here. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring in the wilderness, uh, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, have you, uh, where have you come from? And he begins to ask, what's going on? I'm fleeing from the presence of Mistress Sarah. And, and the Lord said, return to your mistress, submit yourself unto her hand. And I was thinking about this, um, this poor little child here. Uh, does God say, well, it's a work of the flesh. That little baby is a work of the flesh. You kill it? No, absolutely not. God has compassion upon this woman. God has compassion upon this child. He loves every little child. There is not a, a thing known to God as an illegitimate child. There is no child out there that God says, well, it's a work of the flesh. Just do away with it. Uh, and, and I think it's quite an argument against the idea of abortion. You know, abortion has this, you know, well, this child is not wanted. Uh, this child was a mistake. This child was, you know, A, B, C, the, you know, the result of a, a rape or the result of this or that. You know, and therefore it's justifiable to kill that child. How ridiculous. How utterly ridiculous is that? It's absolutely ridiculous. Well, it's my choice. You know, it's my body. Uh, I don't see God say that in here anywhere. God loves that little child. Jesus loves that little child. And so uh, two wrongs don't make a right, right? Yes, it, it may have been a work of the flesh. It may have been an awful work of the flesh that produced that child, but God still loves that child and still has a plan for that child's life as he has a tremendous plan now for the life of uh, Ishmael. And, you know, we might think, well, that child doesn't have, you know, it's just a mistake. Well, there are no mistakes with God because God sees the, the end from the beginning. God sees into the future and he knows what will become of that child. He knows what potentials that child has. And so it's quite an amazing picture that we see here as the Lord comes. He has that compassion. He has that care for this woman, this poor woman that has been kicked aside. And so he tells her to return and uh, just submit, you know. Yeah, it's not a favorable situation, but uh, I, I've got a plan for you. For right now, I want you to go back and I want you to submit and, and just be the good servant that you're, you know, you're supposed to be, in a sense. And so she goes back, uh, but the Lord says, look, I, I'm going to multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude." Angel of the Lord says, you've got a child on the way. Uh, he's, you're going to bear a son. His name's going to be Ishmael. I already know that child. 
I already know that child and I know the future of that child. He says, uh, the Lord's heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man. He's going to be a warrior. And every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And, and again, we've talked about that on Sunday morning. This situation of the descendants of Ishmael. Uh, largely populate that area of, of the Sinai Peninsula. And uh, they go out and they, they have large tribes that uh, will eventually become a part of the Arab nations. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But uh, before we get into that, I, I wanted to just highlight what she says here. You see me. Uh, you see me in this place. You see me in this place of desperation. Uh, and she names God in that way. The God who sees me. Here I am in this place of being used, essentially. Used as a, as a uh, you know, just a, a sex slave almost. To produce a child for these people. And now I've produced a child and, and they've kicked me out and they despise me and they've, they've cast me out. What a horrible place for her to be. You think about the emotions of this woman as she runs away from that situation. And now she's out there in that field somewhere, under that tree, weeping, crying. What, what am I going to do now? You know, what am I going to do now? I've got this child on the way, and uh, I've been cast out. What am I going to do now? And God shows up, doesn't he, in a powerful way. She called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I also here seen him who sees me? She had a very real experience with God. Uh, a very real experience with the God who saw her and had compassion upon her. Came looking for her in a sense came looking for her and, and found her in a place of deep desperation and sadness and uh, affliction and, and depression and, and all these things that she's probably going through at this point. And she says, this God, I know he saw me because he, he met me right where I was and he gave me hope and he, he gave me a future. He gave me a, a plan. He gave me direction and and. And so what an incredible uh, thing that she has, this experience with the Lord there at that point. But you know, it's the, tr it's the same thing for you and I. The God who sees us, He knows, doesn't He? He knows when you're sad. He knows when you're uh, confused. He knows when you're lost and, and running away from a situation. He knows when you're despised. He knows all of these things. And he just says, you know, cry out to me. Cry out to me. I want to meet you in that place. I want to meet you in that place of desperation. I want to meet you in that place of fear. And come and, and bring uh, hope to you. Come and bring to you a plan, a direction to lead you by his spirit rather than being led by the flesh out into the wilderness even further. The God who sees us, I think it's a beautiful uh, name for God. And there's a Hebrew word that goes along with it. Does anybody know what that is? I didn't have time to look it up. Jehovah. No, that's the God who provides. I can't remember what it is. Anyway. The God who sees us. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Well, it's interesting that the Muslims recognize Ishmael as the ancestor of several prominent Arab tribes. Uh, what I need to tell you right off the bat is that we can't put Ishmael into this box and say, well, he's the father of all the Muslims or he's the father of all of the Arabs or all of this group and, and that's why we're having so many problems with the Muslims these days. Uh, it's not that easy. We can't prove it, first of all. Um, but certainly they recognize him as the ancestor of some of their tribes that started out in that Arabian Peninsula. Uh, as I told you a couple weeks ago on Sunday morning, you know, those tribes have been identified in, in some writings, in the Assyrian writings. They have identified some of the tribes of Ishmael. And there are a couple of verses in the Bible that talk about them. 
but essentially, you know, they did become large tribes and they were assimilated into the rest of the tribes that were out there in the Arabian Peninsula. Because there were Arabs or peoples living in the Arab lands before Abraham and, and Ishmael came on the scene. And there were once, you know, peoples living there afterward as well. And so um, we can't just say that Ishmael is uh, Arab, uh, the Arab nations. He's not. He's part of it. He's definitely a part of it. Uh, but I'll just leave that at that because, and I just say that because there are, there are those that try to really, you know, put Ishmael into that peg hole and say he is the father of all the Arabs. He's, he's not. He's a part of the, the Arab peoples. And, of course, the Arab peoples are made up of a lot of different tribes, some peoples from Egypt, some peoples from uh, Mesopotamia and those other areas, you know, all kind of migrating into that area. So anyway, I just want to throw that out for you. However, uh, Muslims also believe that Muhammad was the descendant of Ishmael that would establish a great nation as promised by God in the Old Testament. And of course, um, you know, God is going to promise this that, that Ishmael will become a great nation, but not the great nation that will be God's chosen people that we will look at here tonight. Uh, and so there are some false Arab claims to Palestine or Israel. Of course, uh, how relevant is this discussion for us uh, tonight especially? Uh, what we're reading right here tonight in God's Word is absolutely relevant to what's going on in the world today. And I find that absolutely fascinating. Here we have two groups, the Jews and the Muslims, both claiming this little spot of land. And they claim it based on the fact that Muslims believe that Ishmael is their patriarch. That Ishmael was promised that land and they are the descendants of Ishmael and so therefore that land is ours. And so what they say, these false Arab claims, this is very important because you need to understand the argument as it goes. The claims are these, three claims basically, that all Arabs descended through Ishmael, which I've already told you is not true. There were Arabs or there were peoples there before. And so not all of the Arabs are descended through Ishmael. Ishmael's descendants included in the covenant God made with Abram. And that's a false claim as well. As we will look at in chapter uh, 17, Ishmael is not part of that covenant. Abram says, Abraham says to God, you know, oh, that Ishmael would just live before you. I don't have a child and I'm 100 years old. Oh, that Ishmael would just be able to be this promise that you're talking about. And he would become this great nation. If, if you would just be able to do that work through him. And God says, no, no, Abraham, you will have a child through you and Sarah. And that child's name will be Isaac. He will be the promised seed. Not Ishmael. And so it's a very stark distinction that is made here because the Arabs or the Muslims through Muhammad and their teachings claim that Ishmael is the rightful descendant and the rightful heir to that throne, not Isaac. And so that is another reason that they believe that land is promised to them. But again, the, the Islamic religion didn't become kind of codified until 720 A.D., much later. And their writings are much, much later. And so they really don't have a leg to stand on. Uh, they just wrote their writings to make it fit, you know. Well, we're going to take out the fact that Isaac was written in here. We're going to put Ishmael's name in there instead. And so if Ishmael was the descendant of Abraham and that covenant was made to Ishmael, the Abrahamic covenant included the land of Israel, so the Arabs have a legitimate claim. And so these three things are why they're fighting for that land. Hey, we're the descendants of Ishmael. That land belongs to us. We're a part of this covenant that God made with us through Ishmael, and that's why that land belongs to us. Now, is that relevant today? I don't know. You tell me. Is that relevant today or not? You're darn right it is. It's absolutely relevant. 
the Camp David II summit and the uh, As Aqsa, which is the Al Aqsa Mosque, Intifada, the fight for Jerusalem, essentially, that followed have confirmed what everyone had long known. Jerusalem is the naughtiest issue facing Arab and Israeli negotiators. In part, the problem is practical. The Palestinians insist that the capital of Israel served as the capital, uh, uh, let's see, insist that the capital of, us, of Israel serve as the capital of their future state too, something Israelis are loath to accept. But mostly the problem is religious. The ancient city has sacred associations for Jews and Muslims alike. And this is just a writer kind of trying to get a handle on what this whole problem is and why the Muslims feel that they have claim to not only Israel, but the city of Jerusalem. And that's the crux of the fight that's going on today. Jerusalem appears in the Jewish Bible 669 times, and Zion, which usually means Jerusalem, sometimes the land of Israel, 154 times or 823 times in all. The Christian Bible mentions Jerusalem 154 times and Zion seven times. In contrast, the columnist Moshe Cohen, uh, Cohen notes Jerusalem and Zion appear as frequently in the Quran as they do in the Hindu... Uh, yeah, how do you say that? Yes, there you go. The Taoist, <laughs> Tao Te Ching... Uh, the Buddhist, that word, these are other writings, of course, which is to say, not once, not once does Jerusalem appear in the Koran. It doesn't appear in their writing at all. And so what's the deal? Well, there's this tension between these, these tribes, the tribe of Israel and the tribe of the Arabs that claim their lineage through Ishmael. That's our land. That's our land, even though their holiest writings don't say anything about Jerusalem being their land. They want to claim it as their land. And they want to claim it as their capital. Uh, it's quite an amazing uh, battle that we see going on and playing out right in front of us. Um, now, again, we talked about this being a, a weapon in the hand of Satan. We can take these things that we're seeing. You know, I, I got to tell you, I don't like seeing the American flag being ripped down off of a pole and ripped to shreds. I was in the Navy for 20 years, and I fought for that flag, and I fought for our country, and I don't like it very much to see the American flag desecrated. In fact, I hate it. And it stirs me up like nothing else to see those people over there desecrating our uh, our, um, what? <laughs> Say it again. I lost my train of thought. Dre desecrating our embassies, uh, desecrating our flag, uh, talking about the United States in the way that they do. I hate it. It stirs me up. It gets me so upset when I see that kind of stuff. And, you know, it, it, it gets me to a place where I, I start feeling a hatred towards those people. And that's exactly what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to feel a hatred towards them. But think again about what the angel of the Lord did as he went out and he had compassion upon this woman, compassion upon that child. God loves the Arabs. God loves the Muslims. He loves those people. He doesn't love what they're doing with his truth. He doesn't love what they're doing with his people and his land. Uh, but he loves the people. And we have got to come to a place of putting aside, oh, I can't stand those people, you know, because God doesn't say that. Now, he hates the sin, but he doesn't hate the sinner, right? And he wants us to love them. He wants us to pray for them. He wants us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And that is something that you and I have got to get a handle on uh, in the face of, of all the things we're seeing right now an ambassador being burned alive. Uh, well, you know, he, he was burned inside of a building anyway. I shouldn't say he was burned alive. He suffocated, evidently. Um, you know, four Americans dying for their country at that embassy over there. 
Uh, and, and these are the things that we're talking about right here that have their foundation, that have their uh, beginnings, their origins, right here in the chapter that we're reading tonight and the chapter that we'll read next week. The, the hatred of these peoples who have said, that's our land. We deserve that land. That's what God has promised us, not you. And, and this battle that has started so, so long ago, but it's still going on today over this land of Israel. You can imagine the feelings that would be churned up as next week we'll look at uh, you know, Ishmael and Hagar being sent out. Um, when Isaac is born and, and those things start happening, uh, they're, they're eventually sent out. And they don't get that land. They don't get that promised land. They're told to leave. Um, you can imagine there's some resentment. And these kind of things, again, don't start in a vacuum. Family feuds. Battles between peoples, they start at some point. There's some reason that this people group over here hate this people group over here. It, it doesn't just happen. It, it begins with some kind of conflict going on. And this conflict began in the pages that we're reading right now. That's our land. No, it's not. It's our land. Get out of here. We're missing out on those promises of God. And, and we were... We were shunned. We were kicked out, in a sense. Sent out to live, not in the promised land, but out there in that Arabian desert, being uh, Bedouins and, uh, you know, just nomads, wandering around in that burning hot desert for hundreds of years. There's some resentment that goes along with that. And add on to that, they start to attack each other and go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth over the years. Okay, now it's our capital and then another army comes and a crusade comes. And, and these things have been going on for thousands of years. It's not like we just wake up one day and all of a sudden there's this conflict over in the Middle East. This thing has been going on forever. Long, long time. It begins right here tonight as we see the, the strife that begins between these two people groups. Um. <laughs> yes, we have time. Okay, here we go. So going into chapter 17, this is quick, I promise. We'll be done by 8.30, I promise you, I promise you. Cutting off the flesh is, is essentially what this whole covenant between Abram and the Lord is about. He says in uh, verse 1, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. Why does God tell Abram to be blameless? Because he hasn't been, has he? He's been in sin. And so God shows up again a few years later down the road. Uh, 13 years later, as a matter of fact. He's 99 years old now, and the Lord shows up, and he says, Hey, I'm God Almighty. Walk before me blameless. And what will happen? And I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. And so there's, a, there's an idea here that Abram hasn't been blameless, and we know he hasn't. He's allowed these things to go on. He's allowed these things to happen. He's allowed a substitute to fulfill what God's plan was in the person of Ishmael. El Shaddai is the word being used here, the name of God, the, the Almighty is what El Shaddai means, God Almighty. And that's the name being used here as the Lord addresses Abram with that name himself. I am God Almighty, Abram. I've called you out. And now I want you to walk before me blamelessly. To cut off that flesh. To cut off the sins of your flesh. To put all that stuff aside and, and walk before me in the way that I've called you to. To walk before me in righteousness and in faith. And not to live in the way that you're living now. 
And when he says, I'll make my covenant with you, he's, he's really just saying, hey, I want to fulfill that covenant that I've been talking to you about. I want to put this thing into action. I want to set it up. I want to apply it. I want to fulfill it. I want to establish that covenant that I have already made with you. You remember last week we had that covenant that God set up. I will make that covenant. I'll establish that covenant between me and you. And I will multiply you. Abram, he's going to change his name here to father of a multitude. We looked at last week. Abram means fa- uh, exalted father or high father. Uh, he's going to change his name now to father of a multitude. And so in verse 3 he says, Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but, you, but your name shall be Abram. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to God, to be God uh, to you and your descendants after you. Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession and I will be their God. And so these are not new things. This is a a retelling to Abram what he's already told him. I'm going to do these things for you. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to give you this land. Now come on, let's go. Walk before me blamelessly. Don't put these works of the flesh before this plan that I have for you. God said to Abram, verse 9, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. The sign of the covenant is a cutting off of the flesh. A cutting off of the flesh. It's an amazing thing. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male child in your generations. He who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your your descendant. And so slavery is talked about here. It's, uh, you know, something that many people look at the Bible and say, oh, look at there, the Bible is justifying slavery. No, it's not. It's just stating the fact that it's going on. Um, It's not... uh, something that that is necessarily God's design. It's just the way that the peoples are living back then. And so God is acknowledging that. Uh, he who is born in your house and he who is uh, bought with your money must be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So cut off is is usually uh, taken to mean killed. If you're not going to keep this covenant with the Lord, if you're not going to allow yourself to be cut off in that way, uh, you're not part of that covenant because the covenant, uh, the sign of that covenant, the symbol of that covenant is in the flesh, a cutting off of the flesh. And it seems very barbaric, you know, in one sense. I mean, it's something that uh, our cultures uh, are pretty much practicing these days. You know, the circumcision thing, uh, it's more of a, you know, for cleanliness and hygiene and those kind of things now. Um, But, you know, many people see it as being very barbaric. But this is the way that God has chosen to identify those uh, in, in that time with him. Colossians 2, though, brings the spiritual uh, and, the, and the New Testament understanding of that to us. And, and it really brings it out in a way that says this is a cutting off of the flesh. In, in a physical sense, back in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, it's a spiritual. Cut the flesh off. Put the flesh to death. Put the old man to death, in a sense. In him you were also circumcised, talking about Jesus, with the circumcision made without hands by 
putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your trespasses and the circumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. And aren't you glad he did? Aren't you glad he did? That's what Jesus has done for us. He has put to death those sins. He has paid for those sins in his body. And when we come to him, we come to him acknowledging, I want that old man to die. I want to bury that old man, that Glenn, idiot, knucklehead, uh, fleshly driven man. I want him to die and I want to be raised in newness of life, to be a new creation, a new creature, literally. And so that is what the circumcision for the New Testament believer is all about. It was a symbol, like everything else in the Old Testament. It was a foreshadowing of the things that Christ would do in the age that you and I now live in. And circumcision is a part of that, certainly. Well, Sarah's going to get a new name as well. Sarai, uh, he says in verse 15, Then God said to Abram, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Well, that would probably make you laugh if you were 100 years old too, wouldn't it? You're going to have a kid. What? What, are you crazy? Oh, man, you can't believe it. He starts laughing. And, and, uh, and shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? This is again Abram asking the question. And Abram said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Not so, God. Let's, okay, you know, it's crazy. He's laughing about this. And he says, Just, just let Ishmael... Obviously, there's an attachment here already. Uh, Thirteen years have gone by. Abram is now, Abraham is now the father of a 13-year-old boy. And he says, hey, I love this kid. Why can't he just be my son that bears all these children and does all these wonderful things that you're talking about, God? And then God said, no. Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and, I will, and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget twelve princes and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. And so you see Sarah's name there, uh, Princess. Her name before is Strife. Isn't that interesting? Sarai is Strife. Uh, but now she has a new name, Sarah, Princess. Uh, let's see, I think we got a name of Ishmael. I've already kind of talked about that a little bit. Uh, as we've seen before, many promises that Abram has been given and Abram all along has been trying to put a substitute in there. And Ishmael is yet another one of those substitutes. I, don't, I can't trust in God enough in faith that he'll fulfill this other thing, so I'll try to make it happen on my own. I'll put a substitute in there. And we all do that, don't we? Uh, but God's will is destined to be fulfilled, to be accomplished. You know, I think that uh, it, it's so true that God will... He'll use us if we allow him to use us or he'll use somebody else. But his plan will be accomplished. His goals will be accomplished upon this earth. And there's just no way of getting around that. Um, I think I have Laughter is the, uh, the name for, Ish, for Isaac. His name is Laughter or He Shall Laugh. And, and just kind of reflecting upon Abram bursting out in laughter there. 
All right, well, just to wrap this up here, uh, next time, this time next year, I'll be back, the Lord says to him. And then he says in verse 22, then he finished talking with him, and God went up from Abram. So Abram took Ishmael, his son, all who were born in his house, and all who were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abram's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins on that very same day, as God had said to him. Abram was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 30, or I'm sorry, 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very same day, Abram was circumcised and his son Ishmael and all the men of his house born in the house or bought with money from a foreigner were circumcised with him. Two minutes to spare, huh? I think that's the last one. Well, the 12 princes there that are spoken about up in verse 20, he says, he he will beget 12 princes uh, and I will make him a great nation. You can look at that in Genesis chapter 25. That's where the um, genealogy of Ishmael is found. But as we close and have the... uh, Come on up, Janet, and, and play us a closing song. Uh, I just want to leave you with, no matter what it is, it's not worth it. It's not worth it to set out upon your own and say, I'm tired of waiting on the Lord. You know, I know what he's told me. I know what his word says. I know, uh, you know, what he wants me to do in my life, but I'm just not willing to wait. I'm not willing to um, allow him to do that sanctifying work in my life and and all that the rest of that stuff, I'm just going to go out on my own and make it happen because uh, God needs some help, doesn't he? Uh, God needs help, you know, and, and I just need to show him what he, what he doesn't understand quite and, and those kind of things. It's going to wreck you. It's going to leave you uh, with uh, a scar upon your life. It's going to scar the lives of other people as now you have taken God's will and, and transplanted in, into your life uh, a weapon of Satan to be used to destroy your own life, to destroy your own family, and to destroy others around you. It's just not worth it. No matter what it is, it's just not worth it. Uh, And so wait on the Lord. Wait on His Spirit. Seek Him. Seek after Him and cry out to Him, Lord, I'm in a a bad place. I I need You to come and lead me and guide me. I need You to uh, meet me at that place. You're the God who sees me. You're the God who sees the situation I'm in. You're the God who sees the anguish that I'm in right now. And I know you care. I know you care. I know that you have a good plan for me because your word says that you do. And so I trust in you and I'm just going to wait upon you. And you watch and see what he does. Watch and see what he does. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for your truth. Uh, Lord, we just ask that you would just continue to do the good works that you're doing in our lives right now. Father, uh, give us faith to wait upon you. Give us courage to just stand in the midst of that storm and, and uh, keep waiting upon you. Lord, because we know these things strengthen us and we know that that's your plan for us. And so, Father, we love you. We ask for more love for those folks around the world that, uh, um, that hate your truth and uh, that are fighting against your plan over there in Israel. And uh, Lord, just help us to love them, help us to pray for them, and to have the compassion that you had for Hagar and for Ishmael. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.